who has any idea how often today you have already been exposed to a virus particle? Well, I'm pretty sure it's close to a million times. So that's what I want to tell you about in the next couple of minutes and also explain why this is fantastic. And I was struck by this movie just a second ago because this guy went really into my psyche. It's amazing how this panic monster managed us to get these things done. But by training, I'm a chemist. And chemistry is the science that is describing the properties and composition of matter all around us. So whether this is the chair you're sitting in, or the soap that you used to wash your hands this morning, or even the food that we had for lunch, it's all, um, it's all involving chemistry. And for that reason, I got very interested in that field. And in order to take you a little bit on a journey why I got so passionate about chemistry, I'm going to take you back to the school in the small village in the southeast of the Netherlands where I grew up. And there in that school we were taught in history, in geography, in biology, but I was actually much more curious. So one day in sixth grade, I found this book on the fundamentals of chemistry and physics in the mobile library that was visiting our town once a week. And in that book, it had experiments, small experiments, how to make a battery from a potato, or small experiments, how to make invisible ink. But it also had an explanation how to make hydrogen gas. And I loved that experiment, because with hydrogen gas, I thought you could blow something up. And boys like to blow things up. Fortunately, the experiment did work, but the result was not a really big explosion, but just a significant puff of wind. And you can see there, in the red roof, that was the barn where I did the experiments on the left side of the picture for the audience. So it is still there, and it's kind of an explanation why I got so passionate about the chemistry. So I finished my education in 2001 with a PhD in chemistry and went to work for a computer company in Silicon Valley in the United States. Yes, there is even a lot of chemistry involved in the fabrication of computers. But there I also get exposed to the field of nanotechnology, the science of making things smaller and smaller. And although making things smaller already spoke to the imagination of people for many, many years, it is only in the last four or five decades that we really know how to um, characterize and manipulate matter on the nanoscale. Because it is really, really small. And with small, I mean a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So it's extremely small. Take, for example, the diameter of a human hair, divide it a million times, and you get to this nanometer scale again. A little bit per, illust per illustration, you see this virus on the back of the slide. And if we take that virus and blow it up to the size of a soccer ball, then this compares in the same way as blowing this soccer ball up to the size of the sun. So it's really a, um, a very small feature. And nanotechnology actually gave us a lot in present-day life, and for that I would like to take the example of everybody's cell phone, your mobile phone. It is a computer that, because it, went, it became so small, is extremely powerful. The first computers that were built about 75 years ago were the size of a classroom, or a small theater even. It contained 3,500 transistors, so only quite a few, and if you compare that to an average phone that we all carry around now, it has 40 billion transistors. And the calculations that the, that the computer on the back could do were about one a second, and a, an average computer does about 150 million calculations per second now. And just to give an impression, in 20 years this even improved that the present computers are 300,000 times faster than the computers that, went, that were used to send the space shuttles to, um, to, um, out of the atmosphere. So just a, a little bit of figures to give, a, to give an impression um, how powerful this technology is. And then um, even knowing that the major components of a, of a cell phone are still um, the screen and, and the battery. And in this case, it's a real battery and not a pack of yogurt. <laughs> Taking you back to the viruses. Biology also provides us with a substantial amount of nanostructures, and viruses are really nice examples of these, because they come in different sizes, shapes, and even levels of complexity. But what they have in common, that they're all built from a single component. And think about this. How many ways can we think of um, making a spherical object? We talk about spherical viruses now. How many ways can we find to build this from a single component? In that way, we have to follow simple mathematical rules. 
And um, one way of doing that is actually applying the symmetry, the simple symmetry of an old-fashioned soccer ball. So if we combine a few pentamers with a few more hexamers, we turn up with this spherical architecture where we have a really set number of building blocks. So for this soccer ball structure, it could be either 60 subunits, 120 or 180, but it's always a manifold of 60, which in turn means that all these fire sparkles have exactly the same size and the same composition. And for a chemist, this is Im enormously beautiful. It's just knowing that the material you work with is all identical. So in my lab, we do work with these viruses, and one of the first things we had to experience or had to learn is how they are actually built up. Well, you can see the structures, the soccer ball structures in the back, and then once we knew it, we could also apply, start applying that. And since we know how the building blocks are constructed, these are protein subunits, we know how they're organized on the pentamers and on the hexamers, we precisely know where certain chemical entities reside. And because we know their position, their di distance, we can really control chemistry on the nanoscale. Something, something else that is quite interesting and appealing is that we can remove the genetic material from the virus, we are not at all interested in the infectious properties of these materials. We remove the genetic material and replace it by metal nanoparticles. And when the na nanoparticle is on the inside, it has very interesting electronic, magnetic or optical properties. And one of these metal nanoparticles we selected was of pure gold. So it's a very small gold particle. And the properties substantially change because we all know gold as a very inert and stable material. That's the reason that a lot of the jewelry that we wear is made from gold. But gold on the nanoscale is actually really reactive. It promotes chemical conversions, it speeds them up. And on the other hand, because of that inherent promotion, it's quite unstable. But once we place the gold in the nano container, then the stability increases and we can control the chemistry. It's even that stable that we can glue the individual virus particles together and make a functional, very thin film of gold that can be applied as a membrane or as a protective coating. The final example, though, I would like to discuss is in medicine. Because the viruses have this very well-defined outer surface, they have a, a, an outspoken reaction of our immune system. This reaction can be very specific. Um, the immune system is actually targeting, targeting the specific virus. This is used often in vaccines, like vaccines for measles or for polio, where an initial treatment exposure to an inactive or a disabled virus leads to protection later on for the real stuff. But this is not exactly the, 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 the kind of interaction which I meant to meant to discuss because the interaction that I, was refer that I was referring to in the beginning of the presentation is much more inspecific. Because when we have this soccer ball-like nanostructure, our immune system thinks it's something there and it starts to work harder, it's promoted. So in a nutshell, when we apply a plant virus, so the structures that we showed on the slides a couple of minutes ago, when we apply that to an organism, the immune system starts to work harder. And it's not when we eat it, because we eat plant viruses pretty much with all the salads that we consume, but when it's inhaled or taken up to the skin. Actually, very recent research by one of my colleagues in the United States has shown that tumors that are growing in the lungs of test animals decrease in size when plant viruses, so innocent plant viruses, are inhaled. I think this is a very wonderful example um, to conclude this, uh, this presentation. Um, it also shows that by a good chemical understanding of the biological nanostructures, we can use them in our advantage, but it further shows that a, a, healthy, um, uh, a healthy exposure to virus nanoparticles can actually be quite good for you. Thank you.